we live in a new world. And the European individual of 2021 is different from the one who founded the Union 70 years ago. He or she has different values and lives in a society that is more prosperous, more equal, healthier and older, less child rich, more mobile, better educated and informed, more feminine, more international, more diverse, freer, secular, more dangerous, more lonely, more critical, more volatile, and often less happy quite a lot of differences. And at the same time, there is much more peace everywhere in the world. In short, we live in a different kind of civilization, and certainly in Europe. And yet, yet people continue to long for an ordinary life for themselves and their families, no matter what political regime they have to endure or where they live. Anyway, it is our time. It is the time of our children and our grandchildren. And I have a very simple slogan. You must embrace your time. Il faut épouser son temps. As simple as that. This new European man or woman has also got used to living in the European Union. He can no longer do without the open space for trade and for travel. And we saw this in the Corona type. He wondered, this new European, where Europe was at the chaotic beginning of the pandemic. He missed Europe. He wanted more Europe, more European integration and cooperation. And he or she also knows that for the great problems of our time, the nation state is no longer enough. Today's man or woman also sees how the European countries have lost their status in the world after two world wars and the disappearance of the colonial empires. This new European is not nostalgic for those times. And besides, Europe no longer has the ambition to dominate the world or to amaze the world. The Europeans, as I said, want to live, to live a good life. They do not want to become great again, paraphrasing a slogan very well known on the other side of the Atlantic. Those Europeans just want to defend their interests and stand up for their values. It is not very ambitious, I know this, but it's very human. History provides many examples of prosperity without power or power without prosperity. The great danger is that some people want that good life too much for themselves alone. The great danger is that they compare themselves too much with others. And that's always a source of unhappiness. As always, somebody who is brighter, happier, richer, and more handsome than you are. So never compare. The danger is that they are too much, those Europeans, too much in the short term. They feel insufficiently protected and supported by their leaders. So those people are afraid and insecure. And this group of Europeans lives in peace, but is not at ease. And it's much more than just playing with words. Those Europeans do not trust many other people and quickly see enemies. And the positive values are too often supplanted by negative emotions. These developments are certainly accelerated by the digital revolution and the rise of social media. They allow individuals to communicate directly and to make their anger and frustration known without any filters, no barriers. The digital revolution is revolutionizing 
democracies. I come back on, the, on this topic later on. And some elected politicians translate these feelings into policy in the form of a falling back on themselves. From nationalism over protectionism to anti-globalization or anti-Europe. And some of those elected politicians misuse this feeling of discontent to polarize, to stir up war between races, cultures, and continents. What is then the truth? The truth is then reduced to what people like to hear, which fits in with that enemy mentality. The inconvenient truth, that means what does not fit the picture, is called a lie. And solidarity with others than one's own tribe is considered theft. Democracy is good as long as one has the majority. As of this tendency, does, of these tendencies does not have socioeconomic grounds, does have socioeconomic grounds, but it goes straight to identity and to self-esteem. Of course, not everyone thinks this way, happily so. But the group that adopts this attitude in whole or in part has grown. Fortunately, society can continue to count on a majority of people for whom openness, altruism, common good and solidarity are not idle words. And we have seen this during the Corona crisis and in my country during the water disaster that particularly affected Wallonia. There was a, a lot of help coming from all parts of the country. Yes, most people are good. I'm quoting a book, uh, a book in Dutch, uh, but it's, it's exactly translating how, how I feel. Yes, most people are good. These people are less susceptible to slogans, manipulation, and negativism. In the Anglo-Saxon countries, it is a 50-50 ratio. The developments since 2008 have only fueled fear and uncertainty. The multiple crises started with banks, the banking crisis, and was followed by the economic crisis, the crisis of the Eurozone, the refugee crisis, terrorism, climate disasters, the pandemic. And when many thought that everything was getting back to normal, energy prices skyrocketed and we saw shortages on the labor market of raw materials, chips, and other things. Suiting me, economists, I'm a former economist, suiting me, economists said that all this was temporary, but no one had predicted it. I really hope it is temporary. So no wonder the notion perma crisis, permanent crisis emerged. And so the EU must find its way in this world of shifting panels. And I will try to outline this, this way that we are looking for. I will try to outline this way using a few core words, core values. The first word is unity. Unity is harder with 27 than with six. But the political landscape in each of these countries, those 27, has become fragmented, precisely because of the individualization in our civilization. In the European Council, there are perhaps 70 or 80 participants in coalition governments represented by the 27 leaders. So we are with much more represented around the table of the European Council than just the 27. And it is therefore not surprising that we often need a crisis to reach agreement. Never let a good crisis go to waste famous word of Winston Churchill. The big decisions, by the way, in the Union are taken unanimously by consensus. 
But, and there's not a consolation, but it's just an observation. But more centrally governed systems may have even greater problems. The United States has only one president and to some extent one parliament. And yet the decision-making process there is laborious, if not paralyzed. Dear students, unity is also needed in our external action. If we are to defend our interests and our values, sometimes we are more so, more united than expected. I give the example of sanctions against Russia and against China, or we were united from the first day on in the Brexit negotiation, and we remained until the end. Often we lack this unity when we talk about strategy towards other global actors, Russia, China, the United States. And speaking about strategy. Then national pasts and purely economic interests still play too big a role. But anyone who wants to be geopolitically relevant has to bring a single message even if there are several voices interpreting it. One message is more important than one voice. What is certainly not acceptable is for one or two countries to block the rest in terms, for instance, on foreign policy. A third observation on unity. There must also be unity around the democratic and human values enshrined in the treaties. The strength of the United States was once that they were one nation, no matter how diverse, with the constitution as what binds them together. Without shared values, there is no unity or no sense of belonging, no feeling that we are in the same boat, no European demos people, worse, Without unity, the seeds of separation are present. A simple question, do we still share public values in the European Union? I will come back on this issue uh, during this speech. Shared values are more difficult, that's true, to establish in an internet society anyway. In contrast to the historic communities, the bubbles on the internet do not create a sense of belonging, a sense of duty or responsibility that would be a basis for solidarity and trust among members. The internet also destroyed the notion of distance and locality. Associated life, so key for a vibrant society, associated life is often local. The internet individualized communication and access of information, and by doing so, contributed to the waning of communities that represented the fundamental elements of societies larger than a family. It's one of the biggest challenges for our societies. I come back on the, the theme of unity. How can the union claim to make its foreign policy more values-based? when it has an internal problem about this. What is democracy? How to treat minorities of all kinds? How to be solidar with those countries and persons in need? Again, a question mark. We need shared values. The second word, the second value is solidarity. Solidarity in the union is not about solidarity with compatriots, but with foreigners, even if they are EU citizens. Those, in other words, those who are living outside our own borders. And this is the most difficult form of solidarity for those who are not belonging to our tribe. It requires a greater effort. Loving your immediate neighbor is easy. Loving your children, your father, your mother, that, that's 
That's the most natural thing in the world. The difficulty starts with the Good Samaritan who helped his so-called enemy. Then you can speak about real solidarity. The union has strong solidarity with less prosperous regions. In the, and, and we use different instruments, the European budget, the new, new, newly created recovery facility, what is called the next generation EU. Um, we have another instrument is the European stability mechanism with the, with the support they give of, to problem countries during the Eurozone crisis. And the European budget, for instance, it may concern annually two to 4% of the GDP of a member state annually. So this is really solidarity. The recovery fund created last year, in 2020, is about 3% of GDP over three years for the grant part. And the amounts go to the regions hardest hit by the pandemic. Summarizing, the European solidarity funds have doubled for the next three years. It's quite an achievement realized in the recent period. There was also solidarity on vaccines. And the main reason for the joint procurement of vaccines was to give all member states equal access to vaccines and to lift everyone out of their economic swamp at the same time. That was the objective. Having been widely ridiculed in the first few months of the year for the slow rollout of vaccinations, the EU has passed the United States and caught up with and in the case of significant members, a uh, number of member states overtaken also the United Kingdom. And the COVID vaccination certificate too has been a conspicuous success and has greatly facilitated the resumption of cross-border travel and trade within the European Union. However, there is always an however, during the refugee crisis and before that, there was little solidarity with the countries that had to receive the most migrants because of their geographical location, Spain, Italy, Greece. This led to a populist government in Italy between June 2018 and September 2019. The EU does not agree on a common asylum and migration policy except on what we call Fortress Europe, in the name of protecting external borders. If only a few migrants or refugees come in, no solidarity is needed. No distribution of refugees among the other sta member states is necessary. So we avoided in that way the problem of solidarity. The EU also shows solidarity with neighborhood countries like Ukraine or candidate countries like the Western Balkans. The hesitation to engage strongly with them and to negotiate seriously with them leads to the fact that, for instance, in former Yugoslavia, Russia, Turkey and China get more and more foothold there. I say it's a little bit too solemn, and I say to those who are in favor of a geopolitical Europe, geopolitics begins at home. You will remember the famous slogan, charity begins at home. Those who want to be geopolitically relevant, they have to start in our neighborhood. There is also solidarity with the poorer countries of the world. The EU is the largest provider of development and humanitarian aid, accounting for more than 50% of to the totality of aid worldwide. The Union is also delivering on its commitments to help poor countries with the climate transition, unlike other global players. But unfortunately, this is not the case for vaccines. The EU promised to deliver 250 million doses in 2021, but it has so far delivered little more than 20% of that figure. Despite, despite being a major exporter of vaccines with about 1 trillion units to 130 countries. 
After unity and solidarity, my third word is democracy. About 60% of the world lives in political democracies. Some just are. Russia and China never have been. The American democracy is still recovering from the low point of January the 6th, but has the low point already been reached? Question mark. What will happen at the return of Trump? Question mark. In general, faith in democracy has declined as it has in any value or ideology. It fits in with individualization and thus the relativization. And you can summarize this with the word of Pirandello, each to his truth. Democracy is no longer seen as a real value by a part of the population. They look at its added value. There's a quite a difference between a value and an added value. A quarter of the Belgians want to do away with the current parliamentary democracy and replace it with another system. More than one in three citizens think that our society would be better managed if power were concentrated in the hands of a single leader. More than half of the population thinks that our parliamentary democracy works badly, but is still the best system. These are the first conclusions of an exclusive poll recently conducted by very serious institutions. And similar results have also been obtained in other Western countries. A modern, the modern man wants to be protected, therefore, is he can have some sympathies for a so kind strong leader. Modern man wants to be protected by public authorities, but at the same time, he wants to be free in his private life. That's a real paradox. Democracy needs, of course, as I said, added value. A democracy must deliver. It must provide more jobs, less pollution, less violence, less irregular migration, more fairness, and so on. That's obvious. For politicians, it's tempting to promise all that. Remember, over-promising and under-delivery. Successive disenchantments often cause voters to change parties and up and up and up with populists. For them, the, for populist democracy is, is a means to power. The goal is not to permanently respect democratic rules. It's a paradox, another paradox, that people are asking more involvement. People are asking for more democracy, in other words, and are increasingly voting for anti-democratic parties. The so-called democratic deficit is, by the way, not limited to the European level. It affects all levels of government down to the local level. The Conference on the Future of Europe focuses precisely on democracy. Its input, how does it work? And its output, what does it produce? What does it deliver? How can we better involve citizens in setting the strategic agenda? How can participatory democracy complement representative democracy? That's the input side of the debate. And how can we improve the results, the output of policies? That's the output legitimacy of democracy. However, the, the conference, the conference is not a convention that leads, have led to the the Lisbon Treaty, is not a convention that rewrites the treaties. The Conference on the Future of Europe works mainly within the existing treaties, but has to give answers to these existential questions about the future of our democracies. Populists 
ones in power, curtail the independent judiciary, the freedom of media, manipulate electoral constituencies, and do not simply accept electoral defeat. They try to curtail the intermediary organizations between citizens and government, what is called civil society, because civil society is rarely favorable to populists. So between the isolated and often frightened individual and the new elites, the leader, there must be no one. There may be no one. That's the thesis, implicit thesis of populist leaders. But the famous of all politologists, Alexis de Tocqueville, taught us that democratic consciousness is learned precisely in the middle, precisely between the individual and government. And the waning of local associations increases this gap. The in-between area is the guarantee of a vibrant society. Dear students, democracy is a conversation. An absolute majority in parliament does not entitle one to absolute power. Conversation must disappear for populists. The language of moderation, which makes dialogue possible, is being replaced by hate speech and enemy thinking. In a dialogue, in a conversation, one respects the other as a human being. And now I'm quoting the famous Greek historian, Tucidides, Tukidides. Of all the manifestations, he said 2,500 years ago, of all manifestations of power, it is moderation that impresses the most man. As I already said, conversation and dialogue can disappear in the internet world. It needs tutu tango. And these are more difficult in an atomized and individualized society. And so the big issue is how to rekindle conversation. How to rekindle conversation is a question of survival of our democracies and of our societies. It's of course the citizens themselves in the member states who must react when democracy is undermined. In the EU, the Commission is the guarantor of the values enshrined in the treaties, and the European Court of Justice is the ultimate arbiter of enforcement. Those who fail to recognize the latter create an existential problem for every state or entity in the European Union. A few words about this new issue that was raised a few weeks ago about the primacy of European law. I'm not a lawyer, I'm only a former economist, as I said. But at this way, I'm quoting the president of the European Court of Justice, uh, a friend for many years, Kuhn Lenaerts. Uh, he's uh, the president of the of our Supreme Court. And what is he saying about this issue of the primacy of European law? He said, it's not an end in itself, but a means. The goal is equality of member states and citizens for the EU law, that's the aim. If European law did not take precedence over national law, one member state would not have to protect the environment or the consumer or the worker in the same way as the neighboring member state that does follow the EU law. It creates inequality. To be efficient as a common authority, member states say they all want to do the same thing in certain areas. And that's why EU law must take precedence. That primacy goes back to 1964 judgment and was confirmed in a solemn declaration to the Lisbon Treaty. If national judges question it, you get a deaf ear. 
if some member states say that the primacy only applies to powers that are allocated to the EU, they are right. But then the question is whether something falls outside or inside the competencies of the union and who is competent to rule on that. The European Court of Justice has the monopoly to control that respect of the division of powers between the EU and the member states. And this follows from the basic contract concluded by the 27 member states. It is not something new. I, 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 say, I already said, even since 1964, the Court of Justice has interpreted the treaty, which at that time was the Treaty of Rome, has interpreted the treaty in this way. So this is a strong quote clarifying the debate. Again, on this issue of democracy, the Americans are pushing for a worldwide confrontation between the democratic countries in the four continents and the authoritarian states, actually China and Russia. A kind of clash of civilizations that has pushed the other clash, that with Islam, to the background. Nobody wants a cold war, but we may already be in one. The EU is obviously in the democratic camp, but with our own accents, especially after the Trump era, which may return. For 20 years now, there has been an alternation between unilateralism and multilateralism in the United States. It creates a lack of, a lack of full commitments to allies. Trump's trade war also with the EU has not helped much. The EU is in principle for dialogue and against confrontation. However, it recently found itself in a confrontation with China when it de facto non ratified, not ratified a major investment agreement with China that had been negotiated only a few months earlier. The reason for the EU's changed attitude lies in values, especially the fate of Uyghurs. China has taken counter sanctions against European parliamentarians, which is a huge blunder and a provocation. But at the same time, all forces, like-minded or not, should be united in the fight against climate change. This is another paradox. Those who are in favor of confrontation needs a dialogue with China and other countries precisely on climate change. This is, as I said, another paradox. Common values with China are scarce, but the preservation of humanity and the planet is one of them. All this is happening at a time, at a time when trade between the three global players is still growing very strongly and when the real underlying dependencies are very visible. Trade between the EU and China has grown by 30% since the beginning of this year to a record volume. Another paradox. We are quarreling. You are speaking about confrontation, but we never traded so much as today. A fourth word is European autonomy, European sovereignty. And the pandemic has greatly heightened the awareness of overdependence on other global actors in strategic areas. This feeling was already growing before the pandemic. It was growing in the EU and particularly even in Germany. This European sovereignty or strategic autonomy concerns many domains, the digital, technology, defense, chips, energy, the role of the dollar and the city, rare commodities, medical equipment, migration flows, etc., etc. And this autonomy applies in relation to China, also to America, to Russia, to Turkey, to the UK, etc. So it's a broad, broad concept, multifaceted approach. 
Common values do not necessarily lead to common perceptions, common actions, and common interests. And the recent row between the EU and some member states with Australia and the US is a convincing example of this. It is not because you have common values that you have common perceptions and common actions. Strategic autonomy is not about autarky, but about limiting excessive, excessive dependence. Nobody can be independent in this interdependent world. The EU wants to acquire this autonomy within the rules, as far as trade is concerned, of the World Trade Organization and without lapsing into protections. But the key question now is how to protect our interests without becoming protectionist? It's uh, a thin pass. This strategy is a political option. In general, the role of political authority, the primacy of politics is increasing. And I will give examples of negative and positive actions. The trade war was not an economic war. It was political. And it was against the wishes of the American business. Brexit was a political and anti-economic decision whose economic consequences are now becoming clear. The economic sanctions against Russia were introduced for non-economic reasons. So what happened in Ukraine or concerning Mr. Navalny. The sanctions against China had to do with democratic and human values. The Chinese import ban on Australian coal was a sanction against political statements of the Australian government. Russia used and is using its gas as a political tool. So the, the, the primacy of politics is coming back to the forefront. Some other examples about the primacy of politics and the role of the state. The financial crisis and the pandemic have highlighted and accentuated underlying economic and social weaknesses of our system. In an inversion of the Reaganite, Ronald Reagan, and Thatcherite, Margaret Thatcher, in an in inversion of the Reaganite and Thatcherite notion that government is the problem, not the solution. In the inversion of that, the state has had to get us out of these crises, out of the pandemic, out of the financial crisis. Without the state, we, were, we never could have overcome those two crises. And now in the UK and the US, from where modern neoliberalism emerged, taxes and public spending are on the rise, dramatically on the rise. Neoliberalism seems to be given way to neo-statism that aims to reduce income equality, raise wages, and invest in new infrastructure, the climate transition, and the left behind regions. During the pandemic, we realized the importance of public goods, such as health and education. And budgetary policy moved away from mere austerity. Budgets and all kinds of state aid were used to save the economies, and as I said, to prepare for the future. Prime Minister Draghi rightly said recently, there is no alternative to state intervention to achieve the ecological and digital transition. If the state isn't present, these two transitions won't happen. Mario Draghi is not known as a very leftist politician. We are seeing we also see this greater role of politics in China. It's a mixture of social reasons, inequalities caused by wild capitalism. The new slogan there is common prosperity. And we have seen this greater role of politics also for purely power motives, the excessive role of mega corporations in the big tech and others, which is potentially a threat to the Communist Party. Speaking about the digital and the role of the state, the EU is leading the charge against big tech 
the EU is moving full steam ahead with rules that will impose more responsibilities on the companies and could potentially limit parts of its revenue model based on targeted advertising. In short, governments, politics play a much more central role today than in the recent past. This strategic autonomy is also linked to the strength of an economy. Geoeconomics is the biggest component of geopolitics. The EU is the third largest economy in the world in purchasing power parities and the first trading power. The EU needs to focus much more, nevertheless, on innovation and competitiveness. Knowing full well that scale and size matters. When you compete with China and with the United States, scale and size matters. Alliances between and mergers of European companies are inevitable. Large companies are forming alliances already now in strategic areas. Fragmented national action is not the answer. For the EU, geopolitics is not the means to dominate the world, but to defend its interests and its values. Nobody dominates the world anyway. Afghanistan was another great lesson. We live in a world without a polar. We live in an apolar world. American companies are dominant in the world economy, especially in the digital, but America itself is not dominating the world. The EU will never be a fully fledged geopolitical actor without a European army. And the latter is unthinkable for the time being, but more cooperation is obviously needed. And the current form of cooperation is insufficient. We spend more on defense than China, but is fragmented in terms of equipment and command. In any case, of course, the EU wants to preserve the NATO framework. But the big question is whether the EU needs this hard power to defend its own interests. The answer is that you can. Since Vietnam, the Americans have encountered the limits of using military power. And finally, the fifth word is future. That's a very general word. Short-term thinking is just as much an expression of individualization, of electoralism, of, of market thinking gone to the roof. Banking crisis is the most obvious example. That's short-termism. All this at a time when we need strategic thinking in the global economic rivalry and competition and with the climate catastrophe hanging over the human race. And that's why it was gratifying that the European recovery plan of 2020 focused so strongly on the digital and ecological transition and not on the classical infrastructure as was often the case in the past. The enormous financial resources required for this transition should be guarded at European level, as is the case with this recovery facility. And this instrument must be made permanent, not only for the upcoming three years. And the EU is ambitious on climate. We have already reduced our emissions by more than 31% compared to 1990 while our economy has grown by 60%, minus 31 emissions plus 60% in economic growth. So you can reduce emissions and increase prosperity. By 2030, we will achieve minus 55%. Our target when I was president of the European Council was minus 40%. So it is now minus 55%. Climate policy will be central in the next decades, although the political and social agenda is, of course, unpredictable. Short-term issues can, in some way, uh, uh, change the political agenda, but climate change is the biggest issue of our time. Everyone agrees on the climate objectives, but much less on the means to achieve them. Technology will not bring all the solutions and certainly not free of charge for consumers, companies, and taxpayers. 
Climate change is happening faster than foreseen in the Paris agreements of late 2050. Time is short, but gaining a certain level of public support normally takes more time. So political leadership is the opposite of populism, is therefore desperately needed in order to avoid a real delay. Delayers is the new word for deniers. Climate knows no borders, but global governments is not possible either. Fortunately, however, the US is back on board. At the global level, we are condemned to intergovernmentalism of 190 countries in the COP conferences, with each country having a right of, a right of veto. So we, we, we see what will happen in, in, in Glasgow, but as, as already said, the stakes are high. We will also have to hit some hard nuts about the demographic future. On the one hand, there is a threat of irregular migration that will come mainly from Africa. Africa will have 4 billion inhabitants by the end of this century compared to 1.2 today. So there will be a much more irregular migration, potentially much more irregular migration than in the past. And on the other hand, we have enormous shortages on our labor market that will surface uh, after the pandemic. Controlled migration will also be massive, given our own demographic implosion. By the way, we are not the only ones. Same thing is happening in Russia, in China, in Japan. So this is also one of the key issues of the upcoming period. Italy threatens to halve its population by the end of this century. And look how dependent the UK is on migration these days. The strongest form of short-termism is open or hidden nationalism or chauvinism. It's more, almost ridiculous to think that one country alone can cope with these problems. This is not to say that the European institutions function in a satisfactory manner. In fact, that also depends on the member states themselves. After all, the EU is still, to a large extent, the sum of the member states. My last words are, of course, those five words cannot sum up a complex and unpredictable world and Europe. At best, they can provide a framework for further reflection on the state of the Union and its future. A few years ago, people stopped talking about the future of Europe. Did the EU even have a future? That was the question. Today and after the pandemic, after that's between brackets. Today and after the pandemic, it is all about what kind of future. And that precisely was the theme of my introductory course. Thank you so much.